What a week 10 it was here in college football. It was amazing. We had such a great day of football yesterday. The noon slate was ridiculous. I mean, delivered over and over again. The 3.30 slate with Bedlam and other games that were coming down to the wire, plus the overtime games there in the first slate, was unreal. The night slate was just nonstop action. Had the quad box going on the TV and couldn't keep up. Needed two more for Boise and Fresno and, and other games as well. So it was an awesome day, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I was able to get home last night for – I pulled into my garage at about 6.45. And for the record, that might be the second time since I've been in this industry that I've actually been able to sit on my own couch and not miss one snap of the night slate. And what a weekend it was to have that luxury. So it was awesome. Let's start with some of the headliners. Let's start with the number one team in the country, Ohio State. Not a great performance at all. Obviously looked a little bit better there in the second half. Figured a couple things out. Defense played well for the most part. Yes, Rutgers had the trick play on the fumble ruski. But other than that, I mean, it's not like this was one of those performances where I'm going to sit there and be super concerned about Ohio State. My concerns for Ohio State are still what they've been for the last five weeks. I'm not convinced that offensively they are elite. Doesn't mean they can't score potentially down the road with anybody. Maybe that's a possibility, but I'm really having my doubts about that group on the top end because the team that they're going to be facing here in three weeks, the Michigan Wolverines, you better have some offensive prowess if you're going to be able to get it done because they rolled again last night against Purdue. This game was 41-6 until a score with like 29 seconds left. That mattered for some, not for all. I will continue to explain... The level that J.J. McCarthy's playing at right now, and I know people are, are hesitant to give him his flowers. I'm not sure why. It's almost like there's a resistance. Oh, because they can run the ball. How hard is this job? It, just look at how he throws the football. Look at the ball placement. Look how he drops it in the bucket. Look how he moves, and as he's rolling to his left, how he flips his hips, flips his shoulders, and delivers a strike on the money. I understand that his job has not been made difficult by the level of competition that they've played against and the style of offense and dominance that they've displayed. But if you watch the ball placement, you'll understand that his level right now playing quarterback is that of just about, uh, you know, top three, top five in the country at worst, potentially. I mean, this guy is ridiculous. He is awesome. Awesome. He missed a couple last night, but he also had a couple drops. I mean, there were a few that would have really broke the thing open even more so in the first half had they been reeled in by his wide receivers. So the Big Ten teams at the top continue to roll. Penn State got that one totally wrong. Thought that one might be a look-ahead scenario for Penn State. They handled their business on the road at Maryland. They got Michigan coming to town next weekend. And I, I was just looking at the line and looking at just everything about Penn State, a little anemic offensively, sitting there thinking, man, this makes me – this one feels a little odd. Likened it to last year's performance by Ohio State when they went on the road to Maryland the week before they played against the Michigan Wolverines. That's a weird place to go the week before you play a legit team. So I had questions. Penn State was awesome. They played probably as complete a game as they've played all season long. So sorry for doubting Penn State. That was excellent. You're going to lose next week, but I digress. We'll see how it goes. Michigan, to me, is the best team in the country still, but that's going to be one that everybody will watch next week. I can't wait to see it. The Georgia Bulldogs, number two team in the country. Couple things in this one. I did not feel, did you guys feel this way? I did not feel like Georgia controlled the line of scrimmage. Now, I know they ultimately won the game comfortably by two scores, right? But they kept settling for field goals. They turned Missouri over a couple times. It didn't feel good if I'm a Georgia fan. Now, let's also give some props to Missouri. I know they're not a blue blood program, and a lot of people have had their doubts. Well, Missouri, how good are they? I get that. I'm telling you guys they're really good. They're really, really good. Are they elite playoff caliber? Probably not, but they're really good, and they're not a team you want to mess with. And Georgia found out the hard way last night. 
couple turnovers, and if not for the turnovers, this game might have been totally different. Naturally, one of those turnovers was late in the game. That was when Brady Cook threw it. So it was really one meaningful turnover, but it was meaningful nonetheless. I am genuinely concerned, genuinely concerned about Georgia's front. I'm not talking about their offensive line and defensive line. I'm talking just in general compared to what they've been. Compared to what they've been, okay? So there's standards in college football. And I don't hold Georgia to the same standard as I hold Vanderbilt, right? They're they're held to a different standard because of what we've seen from them in the past. They're held to the standard of previous Georgia teams. And I look at the offensive line and defensive line in the front seven defensively. They're not close to as good as what they were. Missouri had a guy go over 100 yards in in Cody Schrader. They were consistently applying pressure, especially in the first half, and looked like for the first time Carson Beck was a little bit uncomfortable. Now, second half, things got a little bit better, and they cleaned things up, and they ran the ball a little better, all those things. But Georgia's not the same along the line of scrimmage right now. Now, can Ole Miss take advantage of it next week? Can, in two weeks, can Tennessee take advantage of it? Those are questions I, I don't I don't know if I can answer at the moment. But if there's one takeaway from this one yesterday is that Missouri's real and Georgia is not the same. We can continue to talk about the 25 game, 26 game winning streak, whatever the heck it is. They're not the same. And that's okay because they might still be better than everybody in college football, but they got to play better than they had to in the last two years in order to win comfortably. The margins are slimmer, which is perfectly fine. Same can be said for a lot of different teams this year. Florida State, speaking of slim margins, what a horrendous start for the Seminoles. Played terrible there in the first half. Got things going a little bit as the game went along. Played better in the third quarter and pulled away, but it was far from comfortable. And Trey Benson, of course, hit the long one there late in the game. If if he doesn't hit that, obviously, it's a really close game. It's Closely contested. You got to give credit to Pitt. Pitt's two and seven, one and four in the ACC. They gave Louisville all they wanted and beat them. And they also played really hard against Florida State. And Florida State ultimately made more plays, but still, it it was not it was not a real comfortable game. Not a real comfortable game for the Seminoles. All Washington went on the road to USC. Got this one wrong too. Thought this would be the Trojans' last stand. Thought it would be their their final push. Hey, we, we've lost a couple games. Let's just throw the kitchen sink at them and see what happens. Thought this was going to be it. And their defense was just torched. Torched. For Dylan Johnson, and we talked on Thursday about whether or not Washington would find some balance. That was a huge, huge concern. Not a concern. That's probably a little strong. But that was a huge point of note was Washington is two out of three, two to three, uh, two to one pass to run. And that's got to balance out at some point. Well, they found it in a big way on Saturday. And we had talked back in the summer that Dylan Johnson's probably the name that people need to know as it relates to Washington, because when he was at Mississippi State, he was a dude. He get downhill, ran violently. And that was the first time that I think many people were able to see him in a featured role, and he was electric. 26 for 256 and four touchdowns. Taking some of the pressure off of the passing attack that is still unbelievable. They're terrific. Caleb Williams did a lot of amazing things in this game. It was, he played his tail off. He played his tail off, and it just wasn't enough. 94 points scored in the game. It was an awesome game of back and forth that was highly entertaining. So hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I did. Washington is real. They're back to playing at a high level. And Kalen DeBoer, Kalen DeBoer, I believe I saw this stat last night. This is off the top of my head. So if it's a little inaccurate, remind me in the comments or tweet at me and tell me how dumb I am. I'll welcome that at the moment. I was up till about three watching Arizona, Oregon State. We're Arizona and Oregon State, so I'm I'm good with it. <laughs> All joking aside, I believe Kalen DeBoer 
is eight and one now against AP ranked teams. Remember, he was at Fresno, and in the game that he lost, that was while he was at Fresno, he actually had the lead in the fourth quarter. Guy can coach some ball, man. He's awesome. And I think Washington, this was much needed. They needed to remind everybody just how real they were. They'd kind of gone through the motions the last couple weeks. It was good refresher course that, hey, man, you want to mess with us? We still can get it. So I was glad to be reminded of that. Oregon made quick work of Cal in what was a wild game there, at least in the first quarter. Uh, I remember kind of listening to it. I was driving back during this one from Clemson and was listening to it. And it was... um, I mean, to listen to the Oregon Ducks play-by-play guy, and I, and I don't know his name. He does a terrific job, by the way, in case he's listening. Um, really enjoyed their call. But he was almost laughing after multiple touchdown calls. <laughs> it's like, well, it's second and 37. Oh, there's a touchdown to Tez Johnson. It was, it was just a wild game. Oregon has remarkable firepower and displayed it again on Saturday. Kansas State and Texas. Huge one in the Big 12. Now Kansas State loses it. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't understand why they went for it in overtime. I know that the longer the game goes, the team with more talent is going to go and and probably elevate. I understand all of that. But you're playing against a freshman starter at quarterback who's in his second year. You prolong the game, the likelihood of him maybe making a mistake is real. I would not have gone for it there in a second overtime. I would have kicked the field goal, taken it, or in the first overtime, I would have kicked the field goal, taken it to the next overtime, and let's proceed as we will. Because they were playing better down the stretch. They outscored Texas 16 to 3 in the fourth quarter. So I'm not sure why the aggressiveness ramped up at the moment. If it's fourth and one, or fourth and goal from the one, I can understand that, but it wasn't that. It was fourth and goal from the four or the five, and Texas made Will Howard very uncomfortable, and they were able to ultimately drop him or force him to throw early and win the game. So a good, solid win from Texas. They were... Texas was a mess yesterday. They got to play better than that. It was not clean football, multiple turnovers, multiple fumbles that set up Really good field position for Kansas State. So they got to clean it up quite a bit moving forward. LSU and Alabama. We had talked for a while that Bama is a work in progress, but they can beat anybody. We've made that declaration known. What I saw last night was a product of the evolution from week two when they lost to Texas to week 10 when they convincingly handled LSU Think about how different that team looked. They were able to find some juice offensively, thanks in large part to Jalen Milrose's legs. They were able to get things going in the passing game because the coverage was going to be soft. And LSU's down three corners, so thought there would be plenty of room in the passing game for them to move and them to create some some issues for them on the perimeter. But Jalen Milrose's legs were the difference in this one. He ultimately had... Four touchdowns? Yeah, four touchdowns in the game. And he was very decisive when he took off as well. That was what we need to see from Jalen Milrow moving forward. If he plays that well, it was the best game of his career. If he plays that well moving forward and continues to display that confidence, they're going to be in really good shape because he's super dynamic. You could see that from the first start he ever made last year. The first time he was inserted in the lineup in an extended playing time role in meaningful minutes against Arkansas, you can see that he's super dynamic. But it looked early on like he lacked a little confidence in the passing game. That confidence now is growing, and it's growing exponentially. And he looked more comfortable last night than he's looked all season long at times. I thought he played beautiful game, a beautiful game. And the defense, too, in the second half to hold that LSU team to just seven points. Very impressive. This team has been a second-half team all season long. So Bama reminds everybody, hey, man, we're still here, and I hope the world has taken notice because they're a very dangerous football team when they don't turn it over. Very dangerous football team when they don't turn it over. Uh, Jaden Daniels, too. I hate that he got hurt in the game because he was on 
he was rolling. I mean, he was playing a great football game prior to the injury. And a lot of people are are real bent out of shape about the hit. Was it targeting? Was it not targeting? It was dirty. When I first saw it, I thought it was targeting. Watched it over again two or three times, right? The CBS crew, I thought, did a really good job of documenting, here's the hit, let's show it again from a different angle, a different angle. I, I didn't think it was dirty. I think it was just a physical hit. I, I Dallas Turner, I've been watching him forever. He's not a dirty player. Uh, I didn't think it was dirty at all. Was it a little high? Yes. Could it have been called targeting? Yes, probably. But ultimately, what I'm most disappointed in is that Jaden Daniels was not able to finish that game because had he finished the game, would the outcome have been different? Probably not. Bama still probably wins the game. But he was having one of the better nights of his career. And I know he had the pick or whatnot, but he was playing great football there with his legs and keeping things alive and dropping things in the buck. I mean, the throw he made to neighbors down the right sideline where the guy adjusted his right leg and 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 stepped down. I mean, that, that window was about this big, and he was able to fit it in there. So thoroughly enjoyed watching him play and thoroughly have enjoyed watching Alabama elevate these last couple of weeks. And now, man, you look at what Bama has down the stretch. They got Auburn, they got Kentucky, you got a sandwich game there in the middle, and then they might have Georgia. And Bama, right now, I think they got a real strong chance against the Georgia Bulldogs. Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, Bedlam. It delivered. <laughs> it was terrific. A terrific game. Everyone's seemingly talking about the, the pass interference, no call, call, whatever. And there are so many other layers to this game that I want to stress. I mean, the fact that they were able to run the football as well as they were. Ollie Gordon, not as efficient as he's been in recent weeks, but still going over 130 yards, a couple touchdowns. Gabriel had some moments that were that were outstanding. Uh, Owens for Oklahoma State really having a big day as well. This was an awesome game. And what a way to send this matchup out. I, I hope it comes back. Um, I'm very impressed by Oklahoma State. They're now in the driver's seat. Oklahoma's a game and a half back in the Big 12, so it's unlikely that we see the Sooners in the Big 12 championship game. But I'm looking at Oklahoma State, and and I'm just thoroughly impressed with how Mike Gundy's handled this team. It was ugly early. The South Alabama game was a look in the mirror, we got to figure this out type of thing. And man, they have flipped the switch and have found something here down the stretch, man. They're going to be a tough out. They remind me a lot of Kansas State last year. Kansas State ultimately went on to win the Big 12, but they remind me of that. You have a game-changing running back. Kansas State had Deuce Vaughn. Oklahoma State has Ollie Gordon. You got a solid and serviceable quarterback that knows and understands how he fits into the scheme. You got Bowman at Oklahoma State. Then you had last year, you had Howard at, at Kansas State. You got pretty good group along the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively. Man, there's a lot to like about what Oklahoma State's bringing to the table right now. An emotional game that was a great win for Mike Gundy, a guy that had not had a ton of success, just six wins in his 32 years associated with Oklahoma State, just six wins prior to yesterday. He gets one and sends the Sooners off to the SEC in a losing fashion. Texas A&M, good fight against Ole Miss. I still, for the life of me, understand. I, I, Max Johnson frustrates me at no end. I mean, he the 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 turnover, the interception in the red zone was just a killer, absolute killer. But they played their tail off and and found a way to get, you know, go the distance with Ole Miss. Trey Harris, incredible! What an incredible game. Thought that was possible given Texas A&M's issues in the secondary with multiple guys out and down. So it's not. Totally shocking, but even to have that level of production was a little surprising. So Ole Miss is very, very, very hot right now, especially offensively. They'll be taking on the George Bulldogs next week, and that will be an impressive matchup. Finally, we'll finish here. Louisville handles their business against Virginia Tech. Isaac Grendo having a big day, a couple long touchdowns, physical touchdowns. Hadn't really been that guy that's going to take the top off. That's been Jawar Jordan. But Isaac Garendo having a big day. Plummer just continues to manage the game. Nothing to see there. I'm telling you, man, Louisville's for real. We did their game last week against Duke. And I came back last Sunday and said, this team is for real. They're legit. They're no joke. And they're really good on defense. Well, they they impressed everybody yesterday. I'm, I don't know how many people watched it. It was a complete beatdown. But either way, 
very, very impressive performance from the Louisville Cardinals. A uh, couple other things to just hit you on. Clemson bounces back. We'll hit that tomorrow. Oregon State holds serve against Colorado, even though Colorado had a nice fourth quarter surge. That will hit tomorrow. Tennessee, why are we playing UConn in November? Uh, Arizona State gets hammered by Utah in a back in a uh, in a reminder that Utah is still a legit game. Thought there might be a look ahead situation there for Utah, but it wasn't to be. Arizona beats UCLA. Arizona is now bowl eligible. Congrats to Jed Fish and the guys for having one of the better turnarounds that no one's really talking about in college football. Noah Fafita, backup quarterback thrust in the lineup. We were all talking about Jane Delora earlier on in the season, and now Noah Fafita's in, and they're actually playing better offensively. It's really impressive to watch. Kansas gets a big win on the road at Iowa State to keep their Big 12 hopes alive. Tulane in a nail-biter against East Carolina. Not pretty. Uh, whatsoever, but hey, it looks good in the final. They get the win, and it was it was an ugly one and a tough one to boot. Army at Air Force. Uh, it weren't at Air Force. They were at uh, Mile High Stadium. What a beatdown. Uh, 17 first quarter points. There was... I didn't see this coming. Uh, I feel bad for Air Force. It was a, a really bad performance. Tough day at the office, and it is what it is. Arkansas beats Florida in overtime. Uh, first win for Arkansas after a five-game losing streak. So tough times down there in the swamp. So that is really concerning. A few others that we'll get to, but we'll hit those tomorrow. We appreciate you being here with us on the Sunday. Just a little Sunday bounce around, hit a couple of the bigger topics from what we saw yesterday. We hope you have a terrific, terrific day. And for all of us here at Always College Football, from Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an amazing day and we'll see you tomorrow on Always College Football.